Ya? Hai, Domin. Iya, iya. Sorry. Sorry, Domin. Sorry. Nah, nah, it's okay, Mama. Sorry. 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 Just go into a place where internet is bad. Just give me a minute. Uh, hello. Uh, good evening, you all. Sorry, I got a little late. Uh, so while Niranjan is uh, uh, arranging his uh, connection and all, let me introduce Niranjan. So, uh, Uh, hello. Uh, good evening once again. Uh, sorry about these uh, technical issues. Uh, so uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Niranjan Disanayaka, the today's speaker today. So uh, in fact, Dr. Niranjan does not need much introduction to this audience. He has done several lectures to the uh, our students and uh, he is a very active uh, teacher and uh, like external resource person who is always contributing to PEMSA activities. He's in the PEMSA Council and he was a past uh, secretary as well. Uh, so Dr. Niranjan Disanayaki is currently working as a consultant respiratory physician at uh, Teaching Hospital Ratnapura. Uh, and uh, before working at Ratnapura, he, has, uh, he was the consultant respiratory physician at uh, Badulla and also at Nuorelia. So uh, he's a very experienced clinician. And also he serves as a uh, specialty board member in respiratory medicine at the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine. Uh, so uh, Dr. Niranjan has done a lot of lectures to us. Uh, he has done, he actually, uh, he did the inaugural lecture, the first lecture of the uh, PEMSA evening lecture series on uh, breathlessness, which was a well attended, very interesting lecture. So today Dr. Niranjan is going to speak to us about the case of the crackling lung. Again, another very interesting topic. Uh, and he will be he will be basing his discussion on several interesting cases. So without taking much of his time, so let me introduce, let me invite Dr. Niranjan to the uh, podium. So uh, it's over to you, Niranjan. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Anshan, if you are ready, uh, we can start now. Yes. It's indeed a pleasure to be part of. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me at the middle? Uh, can you hear very, me? It was, little, uh, uh, it, it was little slow. Uh, yeah, I think right. we can hear you now. Yes, right. Uh, it's clear now. Now it's clear. Uh, yes, yes. Now it's clear and we can see your screen also. Yes. All right, good. Okay, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Duminda, for that kind introduction. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be part of uh, PEMSA, uh, which I consider uh, being a, as a great honor uh, to be a part of, even though I'm far away from my faculty, my alma mater, I still am a part of the faculty. I, that's the feeling that I get. And uh, I thought of discussing this interesting topic because there are a lot of confusions in understanding uh, interstitial lung diseases. So I would like to highlight uh, some interesting, important aspects, hopefully without confusing you regarding this very important topic. And uh, at the end of the uh, 
uh, presentation as well as uh, during the presentation, please feel free to ask questions. And I'll be also basically asking some questions from you. So this is uh, basically in the first part, I will be, it's almost like a case-based discussion, but uh, I will be putting some questions to you. So I really want you to answer them at least in the chat box so that uh, you have to commit yourself for the answers. So there, there's a saying that it is the mistakes that you do, you will remember uh, than what you do correctly, right? So without much delay, I will start my presentation on the case of crackling the uh, case of the crackling lung. Okay, let me introduce this uh, gentleman to you. And uh, this gentleman, basically, uh, I will not name him. Uh, so we will listen to his story, basically. Now, this gentleman is a 67 year old, uh, small scale tea grower. We know that in Ratnapura, there's a lot of uh, tea estates, which uh, are owned by uh, single owners, a, a very small amount of tea they grow. Uh, and they usually plug those uh, plug the tea by themselves, and then they sell it to the uh, uh, the uh, estate uh, so that they can earn some money. And this is this gentleman for the past uh, forty five to six years, uh, fifty years, have been a small cell tea grower, uh, looking after his own uh, tea estate, a very small tea estate. Unfortunately, uh, probably because of the influence of our. Uh, film heroes uh, during the yesteryear, like Mr. Garmini Fonseca. He has started smoking when he was uh, going to school, and uh, he has a heavy uh, smoking history as well. Right? And on top of that, uh, he has hypertension. And as you know, usually when you have hypertension in the village, uh, uh, the village people think that when you take treatment, the hypertension will go off. And uh, because the next time when the doctor T sees your blood pressure, checks your blood pressure, they say that you are okay, you don't have any blood pressure, and they think that that is okay, and they stop the treatment. And in, this patient also has taken treatment for hypertension, unfortunately, but uh, has stopped treatment, and he has been abruptly uh, on and off on treatment with, for hypertension. The main reason that he came uh, to the district chest clinic uh, Ratnapura is that he has he has now he is now finding it significantly difficult in going to his estate about a half kilometer away. Uh, he has to climb some steps uh, to go to the uh, to the small estate that he has. Uh, but on, on, from about one year's time, he has noticed that he is finding increasingly difficult to climb those steps, about 30 to 40 steps at a stretch. And uh, this has been a gradual onset shortness of breath. Um, and he says that earlier, about two or three years back, he was able to climb these steps, uh, we say in Ekahusmata, right? But now he has to stop three to four times uh, while he was going to, uh, to his uh, stay estate. So that he's concerned because he, even though he, he looks a little bit uh, thin, I, we know that these village people are very, very uh, uh, hardy and uh, they can withstand any uh, stress, right? So, but, and because of this, uh, he came to the uh, chest link. And this is one of the pictures that we have. Uh, this is actually not his, uh, of the small growers. They usually grow some tea and then there are some, uh, uh, what you call this pepper. And sometimes there are a lot of, there is, there is one or two coconut trees. And so they grow these uh, on themselves and they have a small patch of vegetable as well in most of the areas. And they use these uh, things to uh, earn some money as well as to for their day-to-day -day consumption as well. And we know that in Ratnapura area, we have rubber and usually you smoke the rubber in what we call a dunge. And he has been uh, exposed to this dunge infrequently and uh, in certain periods of his life, not significantly. Uh, but other than that, uh, there are no significant other exposure histories. And the other nagging thing that he has is a little bit of a dry cough, uh, dry cough which comes on uh, when he exerts himself. And sometimes it comes out of the blues uh, and it stays for a bit him for about one or two minutes and then it goes off. But uh, other than that, he has been not been very uh, uh, concerned about that. He has already been questioned. He has already always, he has noticed that there are instances where he has noticed, especially when he has uh, stood for some time, uh, there's a mild swelling of legs. 
So, uh, so, so how can we explain his concerns? And I really want you to answer this uh, question. If you can, I would uh, rather like you to, uh, you know, use the chat box and uh, uh, answer my question. Basically, how can we explain his con uh, concerns? Now, in summary, this is a 67 year old uh, small tea holder who has been a smoker uh, with a 20 pack year history with occasional exposure to Dunge and uh, with mild ankle edema and episodes of uh, dry cough, uh, which has been nagging him. So can we explain his, uh, his uh, symptoms uh, with the diseases that we know? Right. So uh, obviously, uh, we can think about uh, several differential diagnoses uh, for this patient, right? This is it. So yeah, there had been an answer. Yeah, the, uh, thank you, M15. So there is COPD, and probably that is my first differential diagnosis as well. And thank you for that uh, answer. And I all, all I expect all 120 of you to do that. Because you have to think and you have to answer this uh, interactive case-based uh, discussion. And, uh, you know, it is very important. It's rather, you should not make it a lecture. And I try my best not to make it a lecture as well. So is it obstructive airway disease? Yes, there are enough, enough uh, evidence to suggest that there, this can be COPD. He has progressive shortness of breath uh, lasting for about one or two years. Heavy smoking history. On top of that, he has been exposed to the Dunge as well. He has noticed a little bit of uh, ankle edema, which might be explained by a bit of uh, copalmenale. And uh, sometimes there might be evidence of a little bit of heart failure as well. So that is certainly uh, the first thing that we have to think about. Or because this patient has been a, the, 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 a patient who has had hypertension, which has not been controlled. We know that when that when the happened, what basically happens is that uh, So uh, uh, what happens is when you have uh, hypertension, uh, sorry, this uh, point is playing with me, right? Basically what happens is that you can see this heart. I think you can see my pointer very well. So this is basically a systolic heart failure where when the heart uh, malfunctions, the ventricle malfunctions, what happens is that the heart cannot pump enough uh, blood so that is called the systolic heart failure but at the same time because this patient has had hypertension for a long time there is an there is a, another entity called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction where the main problem is that this thickening of the ventricle prevents the filling of the ventricle right rather than the contraction rather than a weak systole it is a, actually a malfunctioning diastole that is happening. So when you can't fill the ventricle in, what will happen is that there will be a back pressure that will be affecting the lung as well. And sometimes it can be cause of a, even a pulmonary hypertension. So basically this, this back pressure will cause uh, shortness of breath in certain individuals especially. So that is why even though ejection fraction is normal in certain people, you can't explain, you can't sometimes explain why they are high, I mean, short of breath, especially when you think that the heart is normal, ejection fraction is 60%. But this is the reason when they have hypertrophy of the left ventricle, they can have what we call an entity called the diastolic cardiac dysfunction. One of the major causes is hypertension in like in this patient. There are other causes like aortic stenosis, and, uh, and sometimes even di diabetes per se can cause a cardiac diastolic dysfunction. So whether it is that, so that is also a possibility, I think. Bronchiectasis is another concern that we have to think about. Tuberculosis, obviously, because we have to think about uh, uh, tuberculosis, even though it's very unlikely for the past uh, one or two years to have these symptoms, but people come in different ways. And there is uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. I will introduce you to this uh, uh, important aspect because now in this patient, if you're thinking of COPD, we are thinking about copalmonale. What do you mean by copalmonale is the impairment of the right ventricular function uh, due to secondary due to lung pathology. 
most likely because of uh, when you have gut persistent hypoxemia uh, in COPD, which is a well-known cause, which we call copalmonale, and that might explain this patient for ankle edema as well. But there is another entity where you can have uh, multiple clots going in and uh, obstructing the pulmonary artery, especially when you have a pulmonary embolism, you can have in the long term, you can have this condition. And at the same time, when you have DVT and the varicose veins, you can have uh, thrombosis in the uh, lower limbs, which might uh, shoot up to the lungs and then cause uh, chronic pulmonary embolism, uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary embolism. Unlike in acute pulmonary embolism, where you have a massive uh, embolus going in and causing significant problems like pleuritic chest pain, hemoptysis, and sudden onset shortness of breath, tachycardia, and hypotension. These patients can have progressive shortness of breath. And uh, uh, because I want to expose this uh, to you, now when you do a CTPA angiogram, uh, angiogram, you can see that there are uh, these patients has uh, in the walls of the pulmonary arteries evidence of uh, thrombosis. And uh, at the same time, um, sorry. And if you do what we call a VQ scan, that is a ventilation and a perfusion scan, what we do is we uh, in, you know, in, uh, ask the patient to inhale a radioactive isotope uh, uh, associated uh, uh, air. And at the same time, we see the perfusion as well as labeling with the radioactive substance. And we can, when we see the ventilation and perfusion is not matching, you can see like, uh, you can see a bit of, uh, uh, filling defects in the lung. In these patients, you can see that. And if you do a pulmonary angiogram, you can see narrowing of the pulmonary arteries, as well as there are some secular changes in the pulmonary artery. So the reason that I wanted to introduce you to this uh, important aspect is that chronic pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary hypertension usually doesn't come to, into our differential diagnosis. Or is it interstitial lung disease, which we will be talking about today? And then whether it's a carcinoma with a pulmonary effusion, this patient has been a smoker and this patient has, uh, you know, uh, this patient has been a smoker, chronic smoker exposed to uh, this uh, dunge as well. So whether he has had a pleural effusion with a carcinoma that can explain the uh, presentation, whether it is anemia. So sometimes we might miss these uh, patients because sometimes we might think about when the patient comes to a chest clinic, we might think, okay, this is uh, something wrong with the rest of their chest and we say examine and okay, there is nothing wrong with the lung. That is not what we should do. We should think about what are the other causes and do a proper investigation. And anemia is one of the important thing. Or didn't I provide you with enough details, right? So I want some answers from you now. Please uh, type it in the chat box, right? So I want you to name your top three out of this. You can name it in numbers, right? So I will give you... Uh, 20 seconds, 15 to 20 seconds. And uh, it's almost like an MCQ. So if, you're, if this is given to you, this case is given to you as a case, what would be the most likely diagnosis of your of you and what will be the top three diagnosis, right? So I want some answers now, okay? Yeah. Good. COPD, heart failure, TB. Uh, COPD, I'm really happy to see COPD, heart failure is coming on the top. And uh, so yeah, there's one called, uh, that is COPD, uh, interstitial lung disease, and then carcinom of the lung with the pleural effusion. Some say that it is five, chronic thromboembolism, um, right? So yeah. COPD, heart failure, interstitial lung disease, COPD, diastolic cardiac failure, tuberculosis, uh, COPD, lung cancer, interstitial lung disease, 167. So I'm really happy that uh, you have not selected nine, <laughs> All right? So I thought that you will have, some of you will uh, 
uh, right nine, not enough details, but I'm really happy that you are committing yourself for a proper diagnosis. And 617, yeah. Interstitial lung disease, obstructive airway disease, and carcinoma of the lung, COPD bronchiectasis with uh, interstitial lung disease. Okay, right. So that's that's. Thank you very much. I think that's really interesting, right? And I think that this is the way you should uh, interact. And uh, you know that that makes us interested as well, isn't it? Right. That's really good, right? So, right. I don't right. So sorry. I think this. Uh, So sensitive, I think. Next. Sorry. Sorry about this. And uh, this is actually my pointer is a little bit wavered. Uh, so I'm doing it from the pad, then it's really, really annoying. Right. So out of which um, my three main concerns were basically right. My three main concerns: chronic obstructive airway disease. Yes, I agree that that is the most likely possible diagnosis, uh, and we can't exclude in this uh, at at this moment of time. Diastolic cardiac failure. Yes, I'm really happy that some of you thought about it and uh, and committed yourself for the diastolic cardiac failure dysfunction because this patient is a high, high, high hypertensive, not taking proper treatment. That is a very good possibility. Some of you thought whether it is bronchiectasis. Uh, but when you think about bronchiectasis, usually, uh, now that is a typical, when you're thinking about typical bronchiectasis, they produce copious amount of sputum, they have recurrent exacerbations, sometimes they might have a little bit of hemoptysis, and uh, this comes a little bit lower in the risk, and tuberculosis also is a possibility, and uh, and the other one is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, which some of you have thought about, right? And interstitial lung disease, some of you have thought about, and carcinoma of the lung with pleural effusion. I think that it is a little bit of a less like possibility because, you know, carcinoma going on for this time of uh, duration and this amount of significant amount of shortness of breath, per se, with that diagnosis only, we might not be able to explain it. Uh, to a certain extent, anemia certainly might be a possibility in this patient, right? Right, now, when you have these patients with you, now there are significant what we call red flags. Even though the possibility of this diagnosis is low, we have we should not miss it. When, a, when this patient comes to us as a doctor, we should not miss it. So the patient's concern were basically the shortness of breath. And we have given a differential diagnosis, but now we have our concerns for these patients, right? So what are the main concerns that we have in this person of the top eight? We think that there is a possibility of a malignancy because he has been a chronic smoker. And that is a red important red flag that we have to exclude and we have to think about. The second important thing that we have to think about and exclude if possible is the chronic infections like tuberculosis and fungal infections because we have to diagnose it very quickly and then we have to treat it appropriately without any delay. And the third important thing that might really be relevant to his life is the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So with that in mind, it is always now, History, uh, history taking in a, from a patient is not just listening to what the patient says or asking questions. If you have to be active, mind that you have to you have to think about. So here I was malignancy. So hemoptysis is a significant thing that we have to ask patient mind. So hemoptysis might be an important condition that might say that the patient is having a, a cancer or sometimes even bronchiectasis or whether he has when he has when he's having a bath whether he has noticed any lumps or tumors in the neck 
important thing about infection, it might be pro, uh, proper to assess the bronchiectasis as well as uh, with, infect, with or without chronic infection or tuberculosis or fungal infection per se, fever, whether he have noticed any loss of weight, the night sweats. Now, the important thing about night sweats is that sometimes in, when, when you are living in uh, areas where you have, uh, where, you, where you are, the temperature is very high, uh, some, or very, some temperature is very cold, sometimes you might, uh, temperature is very cold, you might not get the typical night sweats. Whether this patient is having orthopnea, we are thinking about the cardiac condition. So whether when the patient is lying down, he gets increase in shortness of breath. We still don't know the patient is a hypertensive, whether he had a silent MI, and whether this patient is having systolic cardiac dysfunction, we don't know. So orthopnea is a very important thing when the patient lies down because he complains of an ankle EDM as well. So orthopnea, whether he has significant chest pain when he walks in a duration to so suggest angina, or whether he has palpitations. Palpitations is a very important symptom, especially when you think about pulmonary hypertension, right? Or whether this patient has been previously admitted with any leg swelling and calf pain, or whether he has had a clot in the lung is another important thing that might direct us to the diagnosis because these patients doesn't have records. They go home and throw up the... Uh, Throw up the diagnosis card, and most of the excuse that they tell is Gangotharia, especially in Ratnapura, right? So sometimes they might not have the reverse, but unless you ask them, they will not tell you. So I have noticed specifically calf pain on exertion in patients who have a moderate to severe anemia, right? So other than the breathlessness, sometimes they can have calf pain, especially when the patient is having severe anemia. In this patient, 67 year old, may have may not, might have anemia like the underlying due to underlying conditions like a blood loss due to a cancer of the rectum or sometimes something like a condition like myelodysplastic syndrome so it's very important to think about this possibility in this thing and the baby so what are the respiratory concerns so we have no asked these questions from this uh, pointed and uh, pointed questions from this person and he has denied any, any symptoms or anything that has to do with the other problems. So, so still, but we can't exclude uh, completely, but then we have to go on to the next step. So what is the respiratory problem that the patient has? The most important thing is this patient, we are thinking about COPD. We are attributing that COPD to uh, smoking, but we know that uncontrolled asthma is another cause of COPD. Some people have asthma, plus COPD together, we call asthma COPD overlap syndrome. So especially if the, whether this patient is having past history of wheezing when he was younger, before he started smoking or while smoking, whether he has rhinitis, nasal blocks, or whether there's a strong family history of asthma, eczema. And then with the wheezing, we might think about asthma COPD overlap or without any history or significant uh, family history, whether when he's having wheezing only, then we might have to think about COPD because COPD tells us that the airways are narrowed and uh, that might, uh, the wheezing tells us that. And there is another respiratory concern that we have to highlight. One is the peripheral numbers because sometimes we are thinking about the possibility of malignancy in this patient. We know that there are paraneoplastic syndromes where can cause peripheral neuropathies and there can be secondaries as uh, presenting as back pain, especially in the patients with back pain who in the night, he has night pain, then we have to consider. Not in the daytime after exertion, you get, get a mechanical back pain, but if the patient says he has back pain and if he says that it is in the night and it, it keeps him awake, that is a significant problem that we have to exclude. So most likely it is a metastatic pain that we are dealing with. In this age group, CA lung is a, a primary and the CA prostate also we should think as a primary. Headache may be due to secondary as so these are the respiratory concerns that we have to think about this patient. Okay, now with these things on mind, can you now tell me the treptography now? Right, I will give you 15 minutes. So this patient didn't have any wheezing, uh, the negative answer. So he didn't have orthopnea, he didn't have angina, no calf pain. Uh, he didn't have a previous history of uh, pulmonary embolism or DVT. Um, uh, you know, he didn't have peripheral neuropathy, no hemoptysis. Uh, um, he had, uh, he has no wheezing, um, no history of allergic rhinitis. So everything that we asked specifically to exclude our possible differential diagnosis from the history, he has answered negatively. So can you please, uh, like previously, now, the same nine questions are there. Now, do you 
want to think about another different? Do you want to change your differential diagnosis now? Now, there, earlier you said COPD is the most likely possibility. Now, whether you want to change the diagnosis after everything is there now, right? Or whether you want to consider the same diagnosis as you go forward, right? So can you please answer like previously, right? So you have to give me three, right? 612, interstitial lung disease first, uh, chronic obstructive airway disease second, and diastolic cardiac failure third, very good. 168, yeah, chronic obstructive airway disease, uh, interstitial lung disease, anemia, right? COPD, interstitial lung disease, and you have gone into CKD. That's a very good thought. Okay, good. That's the cardiac failure. So six, one, two, six, eight, one, uh, right? Six, eight, one, six, one, six. Obstructs, you are thinking about still obstructive airway disease. Interstitial lung disease uh, comes into the picture now very frequently. Right, now this is really interesting and I'm really happy that you have caught up with this, right? So earlier, most of you had COPD as your first differential diagnosis. Now you are moving towards the interstitial lung disease. That is the beauty of, I think I'm really happy about this audience. So you are, you are rather thinking rather than just listening to the lecture. I'm really, really happy about what you are doing now. So you have now with the exclusion, you have thought about, and I'm really happy, but still that you are thinking about, I'm really happy about the last answer, ILD, COPD, cardiac failure. Yes, because the patient doesn't have wheezing, we have a strong history of smoking and uh, 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 strong exposure history, so you can't exclude COPD. Still, interstitial lung disease is now slowly coming into the picture. I'm really happy that some of you have thought about anemia. Absence of calf pain is a little bit against it, but still you can't exclude big, simple, simple things like that. And diastolic cardiac failure or systolic cardiac failure obviously should be the main three concerns that we have. But that doesn't mean that we have to forget other things, right? Right. Okay. So we will go to the next slide. So at this moment, what my thoughts were, whether it is diastolic cardiac failure, which gives the most likely possible diagnosis, second is interstitial, and third was still chronic obstructive airway disease, right? So we are now thinking about interstitial lung disease. You have thought about interstitial lung disease. So now what is interstitial lung disease? What, what do you mean by interstitial lung disease? The important thing is that most of, the, uh, most of us don't really understand what really the, what the meaning of interstitial lung disease is. It's basically an umbrella term. It's an umbrella term which contains many, many diseases in one lump, right? So we can split into exposure related when these interstitial lung diseases are, are associated with exposure like drugs, environmental exposure, occupational diseases. These are the things that can cause interstitial lung diseases or it can be connective tissue disease associated. These are the second lump that we have to think about. There is a third group called so miscellaneous where you can't put into the exposure related or connective tissue associated ones. But there are specific diseases which cannot be put into those two, and we still don't know the cause of most of them. Some of them are histiocel uh, cell histiocytosis, and some of them are specific in females, the reproductive age group associated with hormones like lymphangioleomatosis. But there are eosinophilic pneumonias and sarcoidosis, of which we don't know really the cause or the trigger triggering factors. But, and at the same time, we still don't know some of them. Right. Especially about sarcoidosis, a word about sarcoidosis because it can come in your MCQs uh, in a significant way. So sarcoidosis is a multi-system disorder where you can see that majority will have a mediastinal lymphadenopathy. All right, about 95% of the patients will have a mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Lungs are involved in uh, lungs are involved in uh, about 90% of the patients, so right? So it is a very common involvement. The pulmonary involvement is very common. The next is the liver, then the spleen, eyes. So basically it can involve any, any organ, but the lymph nodes, lungs, and the liver are the top three that is usually associated. And when you look at the lung involvement, the most common presentation is bilateral hyla adenopathy, which can be clearly seen. There are many differential diagnoses for this appearance, and uh, hopefully you will be taught about them, uh, lymphoma, um, is one of them, right? And 
Finally, at the end of the day, especially in the palmarine one, you can have fibrosis and lung destruction due to uh, 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 the sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis is a disease that we should know about uh, to a certain extent, even though it's very rare. Of, of about 134 patients, we only have had about five patients in Kandy when we investigated, out of which uh, all of them were from the ethnic uh, Moor minority rather than the other uh, major uh, ethnic groups. So we don't know whether it is associated with genetically, but definitely sarcoidosis is present in Sri Lanka and it is a differential diagnosis of granulomatous diseases, mainly tuberculosis and fungal infection. So we have to know about this. And it is an interstitial lung disease because it can affect the lung. When it affects the lung, it is an interstitial lung disease, right? And after extensively investigating these things, there are diseases, interstitial lung disease, we, we don't know the cause, right? But when you look at the interstitial lung disease paradigm, you will understand that it's an alphabet soup. You call it UIP, IIP, CFA, NSIP, COP, RBILD, DIP, right? So there are a lot of names that hover around. And the main reason that people are confused about the interstitial lung disease is because there are a lot of acronyms or short names that are used uh, in the uh, in the nomenclature of interstitial lung disease, and I try I'll try to you know ease it out to you at least in certain aspects, right? Right. To understand interstitial lung disease, I think we have to understand the structure of the lung, right? So this basically is a we have the terminal bronchiole, right, and then the asini, right, and the alveoli are there, and uh, you can have the bronchial artery, right, and uh, this is the basic structure which goes in and sits in the parenchyma of the lung. And you have a beautiful picture here, right? So this structure, this is the parenchyma of the lung because these small structures cannot stay. They can't just stay floating. They need a, a structure that they can, you know, hold on to. So that connective tissue that supports it's like uh, something like a scaffolding of the lung. This is the scaffolding of the lung, which keeps the, uh, the secondary pulmonary lobule in place, right? And uh, this is the cross section. You can see still the beautifully the artery is coming in, right? And you can see the interlobular septa, and then you can have the visceral pleura as well. So if you superimpose the uh, the uh, uh, the the uh, Asini, alveolar containing organ here, you can see what it is this. So you can have, you see the interlobular septum, you can see the pleural space. And in the interstitial lung disease, it's very important to understand what the interstitial means. So the changes will happen in this parenchyma of the lung and the interstitial spaces of the lung. So when you think, when you describe, when we describe reticular formation, then we have to understand where, how it is affecting the lung. Right. So when you look at the alveolar structure, you can see the type one and the type two pneumocytes, and it's a very, very thin membrane that you have. And if you look at the cross section, this is what you see in the alveolus. Right. So this is basically what we can see. So this is the alveolus, right? This is the alveolus. And you can have the basement membrane here with a very thin cell. And then, oh God, right? And then you can see the, uh, you can basically see the interstitial space. And then you can see the, uh, the capillaries of the blood. So this very thin space is the interstitial space. So we have the parenchyma of the lung and we have the very thin interstitial space of the lung. So Interstitial lung disease is basically the primary diseases of the interstitial space of the lung, right? So how it happens is that now when we look at the lung structure here, you can basically see this is the normal lung where you can have the interlobular septa and inside. And what happens is when this interstitial space is edematous or it is swollen and it is affected by fluid, these alveoli are marginally filled with fluid, and you can see increasing amount of fluid in the interstitial space. And what appears is like what we call a ground glass opacity or ground glass appearance. What you mean by ground glass is you can see this glass here, 
where you can see the upper margin, you can clearly see what is at the other side, what is in the other side, but in this, the lower margin, you can't actually see what is in the other side. So basically, ground glass is, you can see some structures, but it is not as clear as the normal appearance. So I will show you some CTs to show what, it, uh, what I mean. And the other thing is, what happens is when this interstitial space is thickened and replaced by fibrotic tissue, then you will see what we call as reticular shadows. Reticular means net-like shadows. And here you can see beautiful net-like margins, which is actually the thickening of the interlobular septa, right? This can be due to fluid or fibrosis. So basically these are the changes that happens. So you have the, uh, the terminal bronchial and going into asini, and then we have the alveolar structure, which is nicely placed in the, in, the, in the parenchyma of the lung, the scaffolding of the lung, right? That is the normal lung in the upper margin, but in the lower margin, when the interstitial space is slightly getting involved, you get a blurring of this uh, structure where you can see it as ground glass appearance. And then further, when the interlobular sector are markedly thickened, you can see it as reticules. So this is what we call a reticular nodular shadow, which we should be able to identify in a chest x-ray, right? So when you look at the HRCT, this area, the ash area is what we call the ground glass appearance. Now you can see that underlying that, you can see the structures of the lung clearly, and you can see the thickened interstitial septa, we call the interstitial septa, that is the reticulation. You can see the nice lines that are there into the uh, marked there, and you can see clearly see that, and you can see the ground glass appearance as well. These words are very important to understand when you are describing interstitial lung diseases. But in the pathologically, what happens is basically the alveolar is inflamed, and around this structure, there is a lot of fluid there, marked the mild fluid is there, and this fluid is filling the alveolar, replacing the air. So you can see a light whiteness here, so which is called the ground glass appearance. And when it is when the inter interstitial space is thickened with fibrosis and large amount of fluid, uh, thick fluid, you can see reticulation in the shadow. And when it is completely filled, when the alveoli are completely filled, what you, what you see is consolidation. So I want you to compare the ground glass appearance and the consolidation. Now, this is an area of consolidation, this white area in the left, right left side of the lung. You can see a beautiful air bronchogram as well, right? And uh, this is consolidation, completely white. You can't, uh, you can't basically see what is, what is there underlying, but here you can see what, what is underlying. You can see the septae that is underlying this lung, right? So understand the difference of ground glass, consolidation, reticulation. It's very important for you to understand the next thing. And when this is completely damaged, you call what we call honeycombing, right? Honeycombing is something like a miva there. I think you have seen miva there. And when you look at this left side, this appearance, we have to remember precisely because that is one of the most specific features to identify a specific type of interstitial lung disease. So if you can see honeycombing and if you can identify honeycombing in a HRCT, that itself gives you a diagnosis, a certain diagnosis that you should never miss, right? Mainly the usual interstitial pneumonias, right? So that is basically what we are talking about, right? Right? So this is what we see as honeycombing. Now you can see here, right? This is this HRCT on your left. You can see stacks of, now we saw the pathological appearance of these honeycombs, and now you can see the radiological appearance because you can't take a pathological specimen from a living person. The best way is to go for HRCT, and you can see stacks of mevada like this. At least you have to have three stacks like this, mainly in the periphery, and this is a beautiful area of honeycombing that you can see. So whatever the cause of uh, fibrosis, or interstitial lung disease, sometimes the final outcome is this, 
This is massive fibrosis of the lung and the lung will be completely destroyed. The lung structures will be completely destroyed. And then you will have severe issues with breathing and other problems. So this is a patient with sarcoidosis who has gone into end-stage pulmonary fibrosis. That is why we have to identify and understand that under identifying interstitial lung diseases are very important at the early stage to prevent progressing into this final stage, which is irreversible. And they have to undergo lung transplant there is no other option for them, right? And this is the macroscopic appearance of a lung. So because some of these interstitial lung diseases, if earlier identified, we can treat, but unfortunately, if we are delayed in identifying, this is the outcome of the lung. So what will happen in this lung? This is a beautiful diagram that I want to discuss with you. This patient, now this, this lung, what you can see here is, you can see that this is a normal lung. This is a normal lung. Right? This is basically a normal lung that you have, and this is a small lung that is called the restricted lung. Right? You can see the restricted lung beautifully here. Right? Is there a way of uh, doing this? Do I have a possibility of taking a pointer here? Hopefully this will work, right? So this is basically uh, the reduced volume lung. So you can have a lung with a reduced volume. So you can understand why we can have that problem because in these patients, lung is now fibrosed. It is reducing the, uh, well, because it is now almost constricting and you can see that the lung is reducing the volume. So the total lung capacity will be low all the lung capacities will be low, even the tidal volumes will be low in this patient. So this will be the normal lung and this will be the restricted lung. And when you look at the spirometry of these patients, you can see that this is the normal post vital capacity of a person, but you will see that their complete volume is very low, especially when you have a stiff lung, you can expect a higher peak, but then it will come like this. And when you look at the flow volume loop like this, you can see that this is what should the vital capacity, this, uh, this space is the vital capacity. And now you can see this vital capacity is reduced in red. So we have a reduced vital capacity. And in the early stages of interstitial lung, this is because the lung is very stiff. You can have actually a raised peak expiratory flow rate, and then it comes down like this. So basically this will be the true picture of interstitial lung disease. Uh, spirometry and the lungs volumes will be reduced. What will happen basically to how is it is heard? So that is very important that we have to understand. So yeah, I think you can hear this uh, noises. So when you hear this noise, right? These are called added sounds of the lung. When you hear this noise, what you can have the characteristic is that these are basically what we call coarse scripts. Now, when you listen to the coarse scripts, what you basically hear is it is in the early as well as in the mid phase of the, uh, the, the lung, the pulmonary cycle. But when you listen to the fine crackles, right? When you listen to the fine crackles like this, it's completely different, right? Can you hear that? Right? So I hope that you can hear. It is basically at the end of the inspiration, right? That's at the end of the inspiration. Now with this compare, compare this with, compare this with this. That is at the end of the inspiration cycle. And here you can hear. This coarse type of a crackle that is come. So the fine crackles basically is heard at the end of the inspiration. So that is because the, when the alveoli are surrounded by certain fluid or 
fibrotic substances, the alveoli cannot open up. It needs uh, the maximum negative pressure to open up, right? So the maximum negative pressure will happen at the end of the inspiration. So when you take a breath, at the end of the inspiration, they will pop up and open, right? And Cause creeps are basically because of the secretions in the large and the small airways. So when the air travel from them in the early and the mid uh, the respiratory cycle, you can hear them clearly. So interstitial lung disease, especially when you are thinking about uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, usually you will hear fine creeps. But the important thing is that all interstitial lung diseases doesn't show fine creeps, especially when you're thinking about bronchiolitis, RBILD, uh, when you're thinking about inter, sometimes like hypersensitive pneumonitis, you can have bronchiolar narrowing where you can get squeaks. When you have organizing pneumonia, you will not hear sound, any sound at all, right? So even though fine creps will help you to identify alveolitis or the alveolus is surrounded by certain hematous substances, it is neither specific or sensitive uh, enough to say that this is pathognomonic of uh, interstitial lung disease because you can hear other sounds in interstitial lung diseases and fine crepts can be heard in cardiac failure and in even a early infections like atypical infections and viral infections. So I have heard many patients with COVID pneumonia having fine crepts in their lungs, but it is usually patchy, not in the basis, right? Okay, so specifically in this group of people, fine, if we hear fine crepes, we are putting more towards interstitial lung diseases, right? right. So what basically are interstitial lung diseases? Now, what we have seen so far is that it not only, it not only involves the alveoli, and the interstitial, even though the primary origin of the interstitial lung diseases, disease is the interstitial space of the lung, but it involves multiple other organs, other, other sub areas of the lung, mainly the terminal bronchioles are involved. You can have bronchiolitis. And then other than that, you can have pulmonary arteries, the arterioles and pulmonary venules can be involved. So it is, even though we call it an interstitial lung disease, Interstitial lung diseases doesn't stay in the interstitial. The primary origin of the interstitial lung disease is interstitial of the lung. But because when it is right, it is progressing, it involves the alveoli, it involves the other structures of the parenchyma of the lung. Hence, that is why we call it diffuse parenchymal lung disease rather than interstitial lung disease. But now the accepted term is interstitial lung disease, so we have to stick by it, right? So what basically happens in interstitial lung disease? Why are we worried about interstitial lung disease? So when you look at this, right? When you look at this, this is the... This is the alveoli, right? This is the, this is the alveoli. Sorry about this, this uh, marker is playing havoc. Okay. So we have this uh, this alveolar sac here. So oxygen is inside the alveolus, and then uh, and then the uh, the oxygen will come, and basically uh, it will uh, it will it will seep into the blood vessel. It will diffuse into the blood vessel. But when you have interstitial lung disease, what happens is that around the alveolus and in the alveolus, there's a lot of scarring and inflammation. So what will happen is there will be thickening of this interstitial space and hence the going of the oxygen will be abnormal. The diffusion of the oxygen will be affected. So when this diffusion of the alveolar will be affected, right? what will happen is that when you do a diffusion study, this is what we will 
see, right? So in these patients, we earlier saw that these patients will have a reduced vital capacity, forced vital capacity, as well as FE1, uh, FE1. And at the same time, these patients will have FE1 to FE ratio, which is not obstructive, more than 0.7. And then the total lung capacity of these patients will be less. And the DRC or the diffusion capacity of the lung will be less. So there will be a diffusion abnormality of these patients. So the force vital capacity and the FE1 in the spirometry will be less. If we want to FEC ratio might be higher than the normal and the total lung capacity and the residual volume, which we do by helium diffusion studies will be low and the DLCO, the diffusion capacity of the lung, which we do by carbon monoxide diffusion will be low. So what will happen is that the patient will have exercise intolerance, right? So how we measure exercise intolerance is by, by doing a six minute clock test. Now this Patients can have normal saturation while at rest, but when these patients start to walk or start to exert themselves, what will happen is these patients will desaturate because the blood cannot stay in the, in the vessels so that the diffusion can happen. So in a normal person, you know, the, the, uh, the blood cells, the amount of the time of the time, the blood cells stays in the, uh, the capillary is significantly even when it is significantly low because the membrane is permeable, you can have a good uh, supply of blood or oxygen to the, to the capillaries. But in this instance, because the thickness is more oxygen, hence when the patient's cardiac output increases, like when the patient walks, you can have significant desaturation of the patient, right? So that is basically what we can see here in this six minute walk test. In the six minute walk test, we have to know what it is actually. What we ask the patient to do is we time the patient and we ask them to walk. You can see these two cones here. It should be at least about 25 to 30 meters, right? And you can see this uh, cone here, right? And uh, the patient walks at his, at his uh, own pace during the six minutes. And he can stop if he finds it difficult. And sometimes you can even provide a chair in between to also ask the patient to stop. And this is actually a very objective measurement of uh, a patient's prognosis. Sometimes it has prognostic importance as well. So it's very important that we do it correctly, a very simple test, which we can do it in the clinic, right? We ask the patient to walk for six minutes, uh, going around these two cords, and then we measure the distance we measure the pre-saturation and the heart rate and the post-saturation and the heart rate. And if we get a, about three to 4% decrease, then we call it a significant reduction, right? So this helps even when the patient's saturation is normal to identify early interstitial changes. So back to our patient, he's not pale or cyanos, very unlikely to be anemia, no lymphadenopathy. Blood pressure is still high, 170 by 105 with a pulse rate of 102. Jugular venous pressure was not elevated. Saturation of 95 on air with a respiratory rate of 20. Now you can think, you might think that saturation is normal, but the respiratory rate is a, towards a little bit of a higher range. So whenever you are, you are telling about the saturation of a person, always we have to mention three things, the saturation per se, what the patient is on, the oxygen, the oxygen the patient is on at the rate of respiration. Because sometimes you might have a patient with tachypnea of a rate of 34 with a saturation of 96 or 97, right? That means that the patient is not normal, right? So it's always it's measured. So this patient has mild reduction of oxygenation, 95, or might be normal to him as well, but the respiratory rate is slightly elevated, which raises a concern, right? And the most important thing is this patient has clubbing, right? Has clubbing. Right. So when we measure the lungs, right? When we measure the lungs, lungs had equal expansion, and we specifically look for features of COPD, such as the barrel-shaped chest, where... Uh, Sorry. Right. So I just want you to listen to this as well. So he had basically a barrel shaped chest, and uh, the trachea was central, and the breath sounds were equal, but we heard this sound. Right. Just listen. I hope that you can hear. 
Uh, can anyone answer what is the type of red sound that you can hear now in the chat box? Any difference from the bread sound that you heard from top? Okay, so what you heard basically in the upper, upper uh, lung, you heard basically the normal vesicular bread sounds that is normally there in the lung, but in the lower zones, you heard some creps. And you, you heard clearly those creps were at the end. So this patient, basically, the lung didn't have a barrel-shaped chest. And the, one of the most important things that you have to see is the percussion of the lung. If you see a barrel-shaped chest, obviously, the liver and the cardiac dullness will be impaired. And uh, this patient didn't have that. Trachea was central. And uh, auscultation revealed normal equal breath sound, equal breath sound with added sound of crep. So that goes off the, I think that reduces the probability of a cancer. Right. Now, Again, what are your top three now? Right? What are your top three now? Would you like to, uh, now would you like to, uh, would you like to do that? So this patient is a 67 year old man, right? 67 year old man who presented to us with exertion and shortness of breath, okay? Heavy smoker mild ankle edema, blood pressure is high, saturation 95, right, with a respiratory rate of 20, and uh, this patient uh, has fine creps in the lower zones. So what is the, what are your top three now? Any thoughts? Yeah. Do you have any differences from the previous? What are your top three now? Yeah. Okay. 62615621. Any other thoughts? Yeah. 625 ILD and 2 cardiac. That is, I think, is a very rational differential diagnosis. 6 and 2. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Usually, uh, obstructive airway disease, we will hear wheezing or ronchi. Uh, in diastolic cardiac failure, still we can hear fine preps. Okay, uh, to a certain extent. Bronchiectasis, what you will hear is coarse creps. Tuberculosis, we have thought that it is very unlikely in this patient. Interstitial lung disease is a highly likely possibility. Carcinoma with the lung pleural diffusion is a possibility now. Anemia, very unlikely. And I think not enough details is now out of the question. So we have enough details after examining this patient, right? Okay, so... Right? So still, interstitial lung disease, that's the cardiac failure, obstructive airway disease will be the top three, right? And can it still be CA carcinoma of the lung because this patient had clubbing, okay? That is still a possibility. This patient can have COPD with the carcinoma of the lung because COPD per se will not cause clubbing. As you know, COPD is not a cause of clubbing. Emphysema is not a cause of clubbing unless the patient has bronchiectasis or an underlying cancer. So in this patient, you can have now think, think about mixed possibilities. COPD with bronchiectasis, COPD with cancer is another possibility. But the highlighting points are probably this is interstitial lung disease, which explains the fine inspiratory crackles and as well as the clubbing to a certain an extent and the exertion is short of breath of the patient. Cardiac failure will explain the mild edema, might not explain the clubbing, uh, but it might explain the uh, interstitial uh, the fine crypts as well. Right. So what is next? Right? What is next? So we have basically to find the cause. Right. So we now know that it is most likely interstitial lung disease. So when we go back to this slide, significant amount of interstitial lung diseases are exposure related and some of them are connective tissue disease related. Some of them are miscellaneous. Now we have to think about these possibilities because the interstitial lung diseases are high in the list now. Okay. Right. 
So what are we specifically looking for in this patient? We are looking at the hand of this patient. We saw clubbing, but if we see this, we can see the appearance. This is basically a rheumatoid hand because rheumatoid arthritis is one of the major causes of interstitial lung disease. Drugs, this elderly gentleman is 67 years of age. We might, we might have recurrent attacks of urinary tract infection, nitrofurantoin. toin might be a cause of interstitial lung disease. Other than that, methotrexate, amiodarone are the other two important causes that we have to think about. Bleomycin is another cause, especially if a patient has had an anti-cancer treatment. So drugs are very important. Connective tissue disorders, we have to think like this rheumatoid hand. Occupation is very, very important. Now, this patient has has had have worked in the Dumge, but he, whether, whether he has worked with moles, Piduru, right? And hay, because these small elements, these small spores can be ingested and damage the lung, which is, can cause hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, or whether he has any hobbies like uh, growing up, uh, uh, what you call these uh, birds, or sometimes they are not growing uh, for the, as pets, but they are using as poultry. So these feathers have certain proteins that when ingested or when inhaled, can cause damage to the lung. That is a hypersensitive pneumonitis. So in any respiratory history, any respiratory history, it's very important to look at these four aspects, especially in interstitial lung disease. I would like to highlight this again. Look for evidence of connective tissue disorders in this patient. Ask the drug history properly to see whether this patient is on any drugs and see documentation of any evidence of any drugs, because some people will not say seek appropriately whether this patient has any recreation, hobbies, or occupational exposures to so cause interstitial lung disease, right? So these are some photos that you will have. And this is what we call a sclerodactyl. In you know, this patient with scleroderma, you can see this sclerodactyly thickened uh, fingers, right? The tapering of fingers that is sclerodactyly, and you can see hyperpigmented areas in the uh, fingers. You can see Raynaud's phenomenon in the left side, and you can see the typical pinch out nose in a scleroderma patient. So these phases, when you see, you should be able to identify in your short case or long case. Specifically, if you hear crepts in your lung in the behind, fine crepts specifically, look for these features in the patient. Actively look for these patients. These are features of what we call dermatomyositis. And in the left, you can see what we call the heliotropic rash around the eye. You can see these purplish colors, colored rash, especially if you are fair, you can see it clearly, but when you're dark, you might not see it clearly. And in the left, you can see the Gottron's papules that is also a feature of dermatomyositis. Remember that dermatomyositis can be idiopathic, but it can be due to secondary due to malignancies as well. So dermatomyositis is a paraneoplastic manifestation. So you can be due to CA breast or sometimes even CA lung. So we have to think about that possibility. This is what we call the mechanics hand. There is a, there is a condition called antisynthase uh, associated interstitial lung diseases, where you can have this mechanics hand, where you can have, you can have damaged uh, periphery of the uh, fingers that is called mechanics hand. So these features should be actively thought about and sort of. And here you can see, in the right side, you can see the Sjogren's syndrome where the parotid is enlarged. And in the lower zone, you can see basically the muscle wasting where you can have polymyositis, where muscles are significantly wasted due to uh, inflammatory myopathies. And in the left, you can see features of sarcoidosis like erythema nodosum, and sometimes you can see even a red eye of this patient. So these peripheral features, you should actively investigate and examine in patients who are whom you are suspecting as a uh, interstitial lung disease, especially if this patient comes to you as a long case or even as a short case, right? Right. So this is a hand of a person in our clinic. Can you name the condition? If you can name the condition, can you, can you just please uh, uh, type your answer? I will give you 10 seconds. Can you name the condition or the situation that the patient is in? I hope that you can see that it is abnormal. Yeah, any, any answers? Okay, I'll keep it for the end, right? Okay, now, what is the diagnosis? Most likely we are dealing with a patient with interstitial lung disease. Probably he has an element of diastolic cardiac failure as well because of the heart failure and the edema that is there, right? And the high, uncontrolled hypertension, COPD is very unlikely now. 
isn't it? Right? Right. So can it still be an ILD? Now, when the history and the examination, where this patient didn't have any features of connective tissue disorders. He, he denied any, any exposure to any drugs. He denied any uh, uh, exposure to pets and other recreational substances, exposure to hay. But still, can this still be an ILD? Can this still be an ILD? I think the answer is yes. Because when you look at the definition or the classification of ILD, there are interstitial diseases with a known cause like drugs, connective tissue disorders, or exposures. And at the same time, there are diseases where you, after extensive investigations, you can't find a cause. Yes, so still this patient can have interstitial lung disease, right? Still, probably we have not investigated completely this patient because we have only taken the history and the examination. There are other things that we have to do, isn't it? Right? So still, this can be an interstitial lung disease. This most likely is an interstitial lung disease. And we think that it is less likely to be a secondary cause causing the interstitial lung disease, but still we have still yet to do. So what is next? Right. Tell me what you will be doing next. Can you please answer in the chat box? Now this patient, 67-year-old patient, presents to us, Exertional shortness of breath, progressive, smoker, hypertension not under control, examination completely normal except for the clubbing, right? And the fine crepes in the lung, no exposure history, no drug history. So what will we do doing? What is the next? Yeah, what is the next thing? There is an answer for that uh, finger called sclerodema. I will discuss it later. And you say, Charles A.T., you are very lucky. <laughs> what is the next? What is the next thing that we had to do? Yeah. Chest X-ray to the echo. Yes. Any other suggestions in the normal ward? Lung function, good thought. Rheumatoid factor, very good. Okay. So in the clinic. The first thing that we can do is a sigmoid block test. Very simple thing, you can do it in the clinic, right? So we actually, next thing, because we want to see whether there's a significant desaturation of the patient. So we actually did a six minute block test. We can do a six minute block test. And this patient had a distance of 395, which is lower than the normal range. Pre-saturation up before the invest, uh, examiner, before the, uh, before the uh, walking is 96, and it has dropped to 91, 5% drop, significant desaturation is there. Pulse rate has risen to 124. So this six minute walk test is positive. That means that this patient is having something wrong with the interstitial space most likely, but there are other causes of reducing six minute walk tests like pulmonary hypertension and sometimes even anemia, right? So that is not the sole cause, right? So then we will go, what is the next thing okay, we can do? What are the next investigations that we can do? Yeah. Yes, someone has suggested chest X-ray. Yes, chest X-ray is there. Right. Any abnormalities that you see in the X-ray? Now you have learned uh, previously what are the pathological features of a chest X-ray in these patients. So can you identify? Can you tell me out of the abnormalities that you have uh, uh, told me? Do we see any abnormality in this uh, chest X-ray? Yeah. There is an answer. Okay, there is an answer for nail dystrophy due to psoriasis. I will come back to you. Any answer for this chest X-ray? Is it normal or abnormal? Or if it is abnormal, what can you see basically in this chest X-ray? Right? So this chest X-ray shows reticular shadows. Can you see? You can see beautiful lines going like this. So reticules and nodules are there. So this is a typical chest X-ray with reticular nodular shadow. So we have identified that the patient is having lower zone fine crepes, thought about interstitial lung disease. We did the six minute, shows desaturation. Now the chest X-ray also shows interstitial shadows. Now we are going into the diagnosis and we couldn't find any secondary causes. Now, what about this lung function now, right? So the lung function in the left, right? Lung function in the left. Is it in keeping with our possibility of interstitial lung disease? What can you think about it, right? 
So if you look at the uh, force vital capacity, the measured one is 1.04, the patient's one is 1.04, and it is about 39% of the predicted, right? You can see that it's 39% of the predicted. So it is a restrictive lung. And then the FV1 to FVC ratio is more than 100, which we see in interstitial lung disease because for that ratio, it is more than what is expected from a person because this lung is stiff. And because the lung is stiff, you can push, in, push out the air very quickly than in a normal population, more than what is needed. So basically, you can have a higher interstitial FV1 to FVC ratio, more than 100 in usually in interstitial lung diseases like this, right? So because the ratio, we calculate the ratio, depend, uh, there we calculate the ratio for that specific age group. And usually your ratio is more than that is specific to that age group, you will have more than 100. So that is why you get more than 100 in interstitial lung disease. So this is a typical interstitial lung disease, spirometry, right? You can see the small, you can see the small, uh, uh, the spike right here. And then you can see that, um, sorry about this, right? You can see this uh, volume time curve here. Then you can see that this small peak here, right? And the diffusion study, if you look at this here, you can see that there's a significant reduction of the diffusion, 34%. So this patient has a restrictive lung disease, reduced lung volumes, and total lung capacity is also 51% here, uh, down here, right? And this has patient's total lung capacity is low, diffusion capacity is low. So there is the lung is small, and at the same time, the diffusion is impaired in this patient. So the ECG of this patient shows right ventricular, left ventricular hypertrophy as expected. And the 2D echocardiogram code shows injection fraction of 65, concentric LVH, and diastolic dysfunction of grade two. And we wanted the pulmonary hypertension to be seen, it is not there. Right. So further investigations, ESR is 34, CRP is less than six. And in especially in patients with uh, interstitial lung disease, we have to always look at the eosinophilic count in this patient because we are thinking about eosinophilic pneumonia. It's 2% with a eosinophilic count, absolute count of 152. Right. So what will you do further in this patient? Now we know that connective tissue disorder, any disorder can go give rise to this picture, interstitial lung disease picture. Now we know that most likely this is interstitial lung disease with the possibility of a diastolic cardiac dysfunction. Right, do we, now this is what is suggested by the ATS. CRP, ESR, we have done, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, DSDNA Smith, RNP antibodies to see whether the patient is having SLE, SLT, SCL70 centromere to see whether there's scleroderma, SSAB, SSB, that is anti jo and anti la that's to see whether the patient is having basically uh, scleroderma syndrome, ANCA, PR3, MPO to see whether the patient is having vasculitis, and then the myositis and the anti specific antigens that we have to do. So if we do this, do this panel, it will cost the patient about 70,000 rupees. But unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, we can't do that, right? And it is not relevant in this patient. So we only did the CRP, ESR, and the rheumatoid factor, which was less than eight, right? And because this patient didn't have any features to suggest, right? Right. Still, any concerns? Basically, we probably think that it's a combination of diastolic cardiac failure and interstitial lung disease, right? What is next? So the most important thing is, we have to identify what type of interstitial lung disease is it. We know that it is an interstitial lung disease. We know that it is most likely idiopathic. That means it doesn't, we don't see a cause, exact cause, right? So we know that it is an idiopathic one. So what type of it? So again, when we look to this graph, I think it's very important to understand this, right? We have looked at the causes in the examination, history, as well as the serology. We couldn't find uh, any cause, unlikely to be of sarcoidosis because usually the, the features were not there. And this probably is what we call an idiopathic interstitial pneumonia because this is an interstitial pneumonia without an underlying cause, right? So out of which in this patient, we are thinking about what we call an idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is the most likely cause here because if you look at the idiop other causes, idiopathic pulmonary, other than idiopathic pulmonary, none of these interstitial lung diseases, except non-specific interstitial pneumonia here, will give you the fine creps of, of this patient, right? And uh, 
and the chest x-ray appearance is also of an interstitial lung disease of most likely of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or non-specific interstitial pneumonia because we had the reticular nodular shadows because respiratory bronchiolitis will have air trapping organizing pneumonia will have patches organizing patches pneumonic patches right pneumonic interstitial lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia might have cysts right fibroelasticity will have upper lobe predominance so it is most likely idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis how can we differentiate this patient there we have the hrct chest right now the most important thing comes so this i think it's a very important thing that we have to identify right so when you are thinking about this chest x ray i talked about honeycomb in here we have to think about two main important things the distribution as well as the ct features the distribution especially we have to look at the distribution where this distribution is mainly is now when you look at these hrcts you can see that the distributions are mainly in the bases right bases and subpleurity mainly near the pleura right so this patient is having subpleural predominant distribution that is the most one that is there right and we have features to suggest this is honeycombing so you can see basically honeycombing so this honeycombing is a very very important feature that you have to look in a hrct in a fibrotic hrct because if you have honeycombing that is usual interstitial pneumonia that means that fits into a specific interstitial pneumonia group right the other features are reticulation anyway the, there will be thickening of the interlobular septae and then there will be what we call traction bronchiectasis. What we mean by traction bronchiectasis is this bronchi, these bronchi are pulled big because of the fibrosis and because of that, the, uh, the, the bronchi will be dilated. So there will be traction bronchiectasis. So in a patient who has honeycombing, who has reticular bronchiectasis, predominant appearance like this, this is most likely what we call a definitive usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, right? This pattern is what we call a definitive usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. That it's very important to understand, right? So there are changes in the histopathology as well. You can have honeycomb being seen in the lung biopsy, and you can have what we call fibroblast foci, where fibroblasts are proliferating in places, in different, different places. There are scars in the lung, and this is what we call heterogeneity, where you can have different types of fibrotic processes going in the same lung at the same time. This is called spatial heterogeneity. That is a feature in the lung biopsy that we look in a interstitial idiopathic pulmonary for UIP pattern, right? But in this patient, do we need a biopsy? Do we need a biopsy, right? So the decision to make a biopsy or not, we will be discussing as an MDT. So multidisciplinary uh, team will come together, the pulmonologist, the radiologist, and the histopathologist will come and say, okay, this patient will need a biopsy or not, right? So in this patient, this is the pattern that we have, right? So can you tell me the diagnosis now? Our patient had this diagnosis. So would you like to comment? Would you like to type your diagnosis? I will give you 10 seconds. Would you like to type the diagnosis? Yes. What are the CT features? You can see beautiful honeycombing in this patient, right? You can see this MIVA, the type of appearance here. Honeycombing is there. You can see the reticular pattern and you can see the beautiful traction bronchiectasis as well, right? Traction bronchiectasis as well. And the distribution is basal and it's heterogeneous. Heterogeneous means in certain areas of the uh, chassis to the lung is completely normal. Certain areas there's fibrosis, certain areas there is reti reticulation as there, right? So this is typical UIP pattern or now which is called definite UIP pattern, right? The complete answer is certain that there are, there are no features to suggest other diagnosis, right? There are seven features that we have to look to suggest other diagnosis, but from the uh, segments that we have, yes, I'm really happy that you have identified that it is UIP, usual interstitial pneumonitis, right? The important thing is UIP can be due to a patient who has hypersensitive pneumonitis, that is a secondary cause, 
right? Or the patient can have no cause at all. So when you have a patient who has with a UIP pattern in the HRCT, definite UIP pattern in the HRCT with a known cause, then we don't call it idiopathic calmified process. We call it hypersensitive associated uh, usual interstitial hematis, UIP. But after extensive investigations, if we can't find a cause and then the patient has definitive UIP in the HRCT, then we call it idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, right? So I think that, in, that, is, that is a very important thing that we have to understand, right? Okay, right. Okay, so this patient, because we didn't have extensive features of uh, uh, other forces, then I agree that this patient is having I, IEP. Idiopathic interstitial, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Right. Right. So when you have definite UIP without an etiology that is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So this is the chart that we usually follow. We look at the cause. If we don't find a cause, we do the HRCT. HRCT is UIP, no cause. This is IPF. You don't need to do anything other than a multidisciplinary meeting. But if the HRCT pattern is probable UIP, I will not go into detail because it will confuse more intermediate or alternative diagnosis, then there is a place for bronchial villa lavage or surgical biopsy, then MDT, and then to decide whether it's IPF or not. The most important thing is first exclude the one cause and then look at the HRCT pattern. If the HRCT pattern is UIP without a cause, that is IPF, right? That's simple as that you don't have to do a biopsy, right? So why it is important to understand, uh, identify IPF, and you can see that here, it is worse than most of the cancer. The only two cancers that has a worse prognosis than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is not a cancer, is lung and pancreas, right? All the other cancers have better prognosis than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the five-year prognosis or five-year survival rate is very, very dismal. This is in 2010, right? So it is dismal. But after uh, now lung transplantation and antifibrary, there is a slight increase in the outcome, but basically it is still a dismal outcome in these patients. Right? And other than that, these patients have multiple other comorbidities. They can have developed lung cancer because we know that these patients have fibrotic processes that is going on. And this patient can develop lung cancer in the fibrotic processes, mainly adenocarcinoma. They can have diabetes mellitus on top of that. They can develop pulmonary hypertension. Obviously, like these patients, they can have cardiovascular diseases because the risk factor is smoking in both idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as well as in ischemic heart disease. They can have osteoporosis. They can have reflux, which is associated with the poor outcome in this patient. Some of them are obese with obstructive sleep apnea. Some can have emphysema and combined pulmonary fibrosis with emphysema, which has a poor prognosis, which has these patients can die quicker than uh, the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and they can develop pulmonary hypertension earlier than previously. So when you look at this fibrotic process to understand the treatment, the primary injury to the epithelium, the type one and the type two cells, mainly the type one cells, will trigger a cascade of events, which will have multiple cytokines like the tumor necrosis factor alpha, right? A transformation growth factor beta, platelet derived growth factor PDGF, right? Tissue plasminogen actor. Uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, right? So there are many, many factors that are coming in here, which promotes fibroblast growth and ad hoc fibroblast growth and healing process, which is the, which is the baseline of uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And usually this is what happens. Then you, when the fibrotic response is initiated, this fibroblast will proliferate and migrate and then it will come into a fibro, fibroblast with a to myofibroblast formation. And this myofibroblast will uh, secrete uh, uh, substance that can cause fibrosis, right? And one of the drugs which we should know is what we call a perfenidone, which is an antifibrotic drug. This is mainly affecting against the anti-TNF alpha and the TNF beta, TGF beta, tissue growth factor 
uh, beta pathways, which will inhibit those and it will have an inhibitory effect and it will slow the progression of fibrosis. It can't reverse it, but it can further reduce the progression. And then the antioxidant activity is there in perfenidone as well, and it reduces the lipid peroxidation. So both of these factors will reduce the fibrosis once it is started, right? And this is the action of nintadinam. Now I told you that there are many substances and cytokines called for platelet derived growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factors, and factors like that. Nintadinam can inhibit that. Uh, the, we are inhibiting the tyrosine factor kinase. It's the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and because of that, it will reduce the fibrotic process. So nintadinam, which is currently unfortunately not freely available in Sri Lanka, it comes as a suitcase drug. Perfenidone is available, but it's very expensive. Uh, to use in the long term. So in most of our patients, we actually cannot give them these drugs, even if it is uh, useful in certain groups of people, right? So in this patient, how are the other things that you have to meet? This patient needs pulmonary rehabilitation. Sometimes this patient will need supplementary oxygen. Our patients will not need supplementary oxygen at the moment. Symptom relief, this patient is having a nagging cough. So we have to improve the symptom relief in this patient, right? And psychological support, especially this patient, if they tell us, especially when a patient is educated and understand the gravity, if we told, tell them that this patient is are you having a disease worse than most of the cancer, then I think uh, they will have a significant depressive phase. So we have to psychologically support and we have to involve the family as well. We have to explain the family that this is a progressive disease and this is what we have to expect and probably you might need oxygen in a few uh, years time and some will, he will slowly die off. And uh, that is the outcome of this uh, disease in the most instances, because we don't have at the moment freely available antifibrotics to give the patient to slow the progression in certain groups. And we don't have a lung transplant program in Sri Lanka at the moment. So in this patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we can actually counsel these patients to, about the diagnosis. They can uh, uh, advise them about the pulmonary rehabilitation. If needed, we can advise them on supplemental oxygen and symptom relief is the most important thing. If a patient can afford, and if the patient is in the uh, criteria, fits the criteria to start antifibrotic treatment, obviously these patients should be on antifibrotic treatment, okay? Again, I am asking, can you guess the diagnosis? Yeah, can you guess the diagnosis? Still no? Okay. Right? So I'm now going into some three MCQs, right? Uh, because I want to discuss some of these MCQs. I want you to answer, please. Which of the following is the most useful in the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease? Yeah, I'm, they are, remember the words, right? So I, I will give you 20 seconds. Please answer, right? Which of the following will be the most useful in diagnosing interstitial lung disease? Yeah. Right, very good, right? So hopefully the answered people represents the majority. Anyway, right? So which of the following uh, is the most useful in the diagnosis of ILD? All five are very, very important in diagnosis. It's not basically diagnosis, assessment of interstitial lung disease patient. So if I asked you what will be the first uh, thing that you will do with a suspected patient with interstitial lung disease, I think the first thing is the thorough history including recreation, occupational, and drugs. That is the first thing you have to do. In a suspected ILD, you have to take a very good history about exposure. Sometimes the patient will not come out. There are case reporters saying that sometimes in, a, in, the, in the living area, Sale, there's a condacurula, and this condacurula's uh, uh, feathers has caused interstitial lung disease, like the common bulbul, and it was presented in one of the uh, uh, respire meetings as well. Occupation, again, we have to think about, even though he might be a teacher, he might be having uh, uh, chickens at home, uh, whom, uh, you know, he, he does, does have an alternative uh, living. So, <coughs> ask about that. And about drugs, especially. <coughs> especially, 
about the drugs that the patient is on. And some people drink other drugs, right? We have some patients who have inhaled various substances during the COVID uh, epidemic. Interstitial lung diseases have happened because of that. And we have to ask about drugs and other exposures as well. Six minute mock test, yes, it's very, very useful, but it is not the most uh, useful because six minute mock test can be reduced due to many, many reasons, even COPD, bronchiectasis, and many other reasons. Serological screening, complete screening, <coughs> most useful you can't say right because it will tell you whether the patient is having a serological evidence of uh, connective tissue disorder but it will not tell you about the interstitial lung disease right complete lung function again yes it will be helpful to identify if the patient is having a restrictive lung with a diffusion abnormality and uh, the most important thing is a chest the chest because that will exactly is the is the eye towards the interstitial space of the lung, right? So I agree completely with your uh, answer and I'm happy, really happy that you have answered that like that. Right, out of this A, B, C, D, E, right? What represents interstitial lung disease, right? I will give you 15 seconds. <laughs> out of these five, what represents interstitial lung disease?
Yeah, I, I'm sorry that I, I think I was disconnected uh, due to some reason because of the internet uh, problem. Um, I only have one or two slides left, uh, so we'll just go through it. Internet is a huge problem. Okay. I'm, anyway, I'm sorry about this. I think I can't get into it. Anyway, I have only one or two, two slides. So yeah, I agree that, uh, I'm sorry, I can't share the screen as well. C is the answer. Uh, the, the last question is that uh, regarding a scleroderma patient, uh, um, regarding the following uh, regarding the following patient presenting with shortness of breath, I wanted you to identify this patient, but I had a scleroderma patient uh, photograph with me. So serology screening will not be useful. Interstitial lung disease will be the sole cause of breathlessness. She has a better prognosis than IPF patient in the pulmonary point of view. And uh, her first line treatment should be antifibrotics and GORD will affect the, uh, GORD will be affecting the uh, uh, outcome of this patient. Um, so basically, do you have any answers for that? Right, sorry. So what I wanted to discuss was that uh, here, now when, when you look at systemic sclerosis and interstitial lung disease, serology will definitely be useful. Specifically, you have to do the uh, CCR70 and the antisentomy antigen, the um, antibody levels. Interstitial lung disease will not be the sole cause of breathlessness because pulmonary hypertension will be another cause that can cause breathlessness. And uh, he had a better prognosis than IPF patient in the pulmonary point of view, yes, because idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis has a very diverse prognosis of most of the interstitial lung disease. And uh, usually systemic sclerosis has a better prognosis with lung, lung point of view than IPF. Anti -treat, uh, first line of treatment is not antifibrotic. In this patient, we usually give mycophidal and mofetil or cyclophosphamide. And if not, uh, then isothioprine and sometimes even rituximab for this patient. Antifibrotics has a place in certain group of patients and studies are ongoing. GORD will definitely affect the prognosis. It is one of the major prognostic prognostic features in interstitial uh, lung disease patients, right? About the picture that I showed you, right? I wanted to finish. I wanted to finish with that. Unfortunately, I can't share my screen. And if you can see clearly, it is a, uh, it is the hand of a T plucker, right? It is a hand of the T plucker, and uh, uh, this is the these are the people who make us uh, make our country uh, earn foreign currency, who pays for our. Uh, health and education, and uh, that is why we have to look after them properly when they come to our clinics, right? So these uh, patients, you can see that. You know, I'm really sorry that I can't see you, show you this picture, but uh, if you can remember that picture, I think it's very important to remember that picture because these patients tells you the hard times that they have undergone, right? So um, I think I can answer some questions if you really want to ask some questions. So uh, do you have any questions? You can type it or you can uh, basically uh, ask me. Uh, we have more to 10. Any questions? Yeah, this is the, I think you can see it, no? you can see it basically, right? This is the patient that I wanted to show you actually. And this is the hand that I wanted to show you, right? So I think you can see this hand clearly, isn't it, right? Okay, any questions that you want to ask me? Uh, I'm sorry about the technical difficulties that we had today. Uh, something wrong with the pointer system of this computer as well as there was an internet breakdown as well but hopefully i think you have understood the basics of interstitial lung diseases uh, if you have any questions uh, basically i will type my uh, email address here right 
and uh, you can you can actually send me an email and uh, whenever I have time, which might be not that brilliant, I will be able to answer your questions if you have any. Okay, right. So with that, uh, if you don't have any significant amount of questions, uh, or if you can, if you have uh, no questions, then uh, there is one in the chat. Okay, so it is. Okay, All right. Uh, so I have sent you the email address. So if you have anything, uh, you can basically, uh, you know, send me an email address. I think the recording will be available uh, with the PEMSA and hopefully when I get that, uh, I will be I will be able to share it with you uh, through the PEMSA as well as uh, through the DTC trainees. I will uh, give, give the link to one of my trainees, uh, certainly, right? So any questions? I want you to ask questions because I, I know that there are some DTCT trainees as well. So I know that interstitial lung disease is rather a difficult area uh, to understand. And I hope that I didn't make it more confused. So that's why I wanted to stick to only with the idiopathic coronary fibrosis. And uh, especially in your long cases and short cases, you have to basically uh, uh, go in a proper, proper way about this uh, diagnosis. All right. Okay, then. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the uh, PEMSA as well as the, uh, the technicians uh, involved in facilitating this platform. And I hope, for, hope that it was useful. Uh, please feel free to send any question to my email address, right? Any question to my email address so that I will be able to uh, uh, answer any question that you have. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Stay safe because there's a lot of flooding going on and Corona is again peaking up. So please be safe and always uh, use the precautions that you uh, use in your normal life. Okay, have a nice day. Good night. Thank you, Sagar. Good night. Hari ini.